Okay, so welcome everybody um, to this brief introduction uh, to comparative historical analysis um, and uh, hopefully trying to show you how history can uh, enrich social inquiry. So let me just introduce um, the topic here by addressing uh, the two central questions that's going to run through this little mini course. Uh, first of all, how does history uh, enrich social inquiry? And, um, and what are the methodological implications for uh, using history? And more particularly, how does um, a comparative historical analysis try to give history sort of a more sound methodological grounding? So let me start with the first question of how does uh, history enrich uh, a social inquiry? And uh, let me just quickly uh, play you a short little video here by a historian, James Grossman. He's a historian at the University of Chicago and the executive director of the American Historical Association. And uh, he is talking about sort of what makes historians uh, distinct and historians what their comparative have advantage is. something different to say about public events from journalists, political scientists. And this is not because of what we know, it's because of how we think. Uh, there's something called historical thinking, which is what we teach our majors in college, and which we supposedly are very good at, and it's what we can contribute to public culture. When we talk about historical thinking, we're usually looking at the kinds of questions historians answer. Uh, for example, when we teach history, whether at the high school level or the college level, one of the things we tell students is that it's much harder to ask a good question than to find the answer. Uh, and that's because asking a good question means thinking about context. It means trying to figure out what's important and why it's important. The classic graduate orals question, for example, after somebody goes through 15 minutes of narrating something or a question that's often asked in a dissertation defense is so on. And it's combining the exciting narrative, uh, that narrative that people find interesting about history with that so what question. And when we say, when we talk about historical thinking, we talk about asking that so what question in terms of context, in terms of change. Uh, the other thing that historical thinking emphasizes is understanding how change happens, why change happens or why it doesn't. Uh, so, any question, uh, any aspect of public culture can benefit from these kinds of questions, from asking, how did we get here? Uh, why did it turn out this way instead of that way? Uh, these are always historical questions. So, um, so let me just quickly highlight the two key uh, uh, takeaways here. Um, so he links uh, history to the ability to ask important questions. This is something that we will come back over and over again. Um, and, and notice that for a historian, the difficult part is to come up with a question, not answering the question. Not that that is easy either, but uh, exploring and defining the question. And that is very different from some of the standard variance-based methodologies uh, with their focus on testing and therefore on trying to answer the question. So asking important questions is one way in which history can enrich social inquiry. Uh, the second aspect is the focus on change, that uh, comparative historical analysis really, as we'll see, uh, goes back historically to the 19th century and, and trying to understand modernity and the increasingly sort of rapid social, political, and economic changes and trying to understand them. So those are the two central elements uh, that history brings to social inquiry and therefore uh, can enrich them. Um, let me just elaborate on, on this uh, element of the important uh, uh, questions and give you here a little uh, chronology of the sort of questions that comparative historical analysis uh, asks. Um, so notice down below here, you have a timeline. This is, I don't know how clearly this is, but we're going back to the 1850s. This is the first generation of comparative historical analysis all the way to the present. And so the 19th century sort of comparative historical classics, Marx, Weber, Durkheim, and so forth, 
uh, were asking four broad questions. One, they were trying to understand the changing nature of capitalism, right? Uh, that sort of was related to the industrialization. Then they were talking about the regime changes, the emergence of democracy. Uh, then the changing nature of the state, the emergence of the modern bureaucratic uh, nation state, and then the changing nature of war. And then as this sort of genealogy uh, makes clear, these themes endure all the way to the present. So the focus on capitalism then translates into the versions of international political economy and comparative political economy and all these various literatures. The focus on regime change gives you the literatures on democratization and authoritarianism. The one on the state, the state formation uh, and state society relationships. And finally, the study of war, um, you know, international relations emerges out of this and more recently the focus on civil war and genocides. And then more recently, we have some new questions being added, questions of identity that emerge out of the, the civil rights struggles of the 1960s, questions about transnationalism related to the post-colonial experience and, and globalization, and most likely also pandemics will be a new item. So notice the continuity of these themes. And really there was only one period here from the 1930s to the 1950s when comparative historical analysis went into a hiatus because we had modernization theory uh, generating the belief that we, we figured out history, that history no longer mattered. But that didn't last very long with the 1960s. History made a ferocious comeback and has been part of comparative historical analysis ever since. So, um, so, so there is broad understanding that history does matter, but what are the implications if you take history seriously, right? What are the methodological implications for taking history seriously? And most importantly, how compatible um, is a, a more historical mode of analysis with the standard variance-based methodologies? Uh, and what tools does his comparative historical analysis use to analyze histories? So these are the um, three questions that I'm trying to answer, um, but to answer them is not uh, easy because uh, comparative historical analysis is a little bit of a heterodox uh, field and encompasses a whole bunch of different literatures. So um, one important thing to understand is to understand uh, the methodological uh, implications of comparative historical analysis, we have to look at its distinct uh, origin story. So Robert Dowell, the political scientist in his book on democracy, asked the question, how should we think of democracy? And he used this really intriguing analogy. Should we think of, a, of the origins of democracy in terms of a steam engine analogy or in terms of language? So what he meant is, was democracy uh, created like a steam engine in one particular place in the early 1830s in Britain, and then diffused from that one place to other parts of the world? Or should we think about democracy in terms of languages that emerged independently of one another in different places, and therefore we get sort of varieties of, 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 of languages that share certain elements, but are also very diverse. And I think this analogy is, is helpful for understanding uh, the difference between uh, variance-based and comparative historical analysis. Variance-based analysis really sort of followed the steam engine model. You usually have one or two sort of founders that came up with some of those techniques. And then from those sort of original ideas, they were refined and diffused to other places. Um, comparative historical analysis, on the other hand, follows the path of languages. It was invented independently of each other in different disciplines. So in sociology, you have historical sociologists that use history. In economics, you have economic historians. In international relations, you've got constructivists. In political science, you have uh, historical institutionalists. You have, um, um, you have American political development. So the point here uh, of comparative historical analysis, it is spoken in different vernaculars. It is spoken in different vernaculars that sometimes make it a little bit more difficult to explicate its shared methodological elements. But what I'm hoping to try to show you today is that um, while 
comparative historical um, analysis is heterodox, it is not idiosyncratic because it shares a grammar of time. And this grammar of time has three common elements that will sort of structure the rest of this talk. The first one is historical thinking that we already uh, encountered. The second one is temporal thinking. And the third one is abductive thinking. So that sort of will be the focus uh, of this lecture today. And I should just point out that in an hour, I can really only give you a very cursory overview over these three foundational uh, characteristics of comparative historical analysis. Um, if you want sort of uh, more details about it, this is the course that I will be teaching uh, at the Methods Nest this summer that elaborates on it. And the other one is, is a book, The Grammar of Time, that I just completed and that will be forthcoming with Cambridge University Press sometime later this year or early uh, next year. So, um, so let me then uh, start first by talking a little bit more fully about historical thinking, right? Um, so um, let me illustrate how historical thinking differs from uh, statistical thinking with a concrete example. So here you have two uh, articles. The first one is by a historian, a German historian, Margaret Anderson, uh, who wrote a, a paper and a book trying to understand the, the impact or the role that electoral fraud played in, in the 1860s and 1870s in, in, in Germany. And here you have Daniel Ziblatt. He's a political scientist um, at, at Harvard who wrote a book in the American Political Science Review that also focuses on electoral fraud in the 19th century. So these uh, two papers are interesting because they focus on the exact same subject matter, electoral fraud, the same country, Germany, and the same historical period. But they come at it from very different per perspectives and therefore help us illustrate what makes historical thinking uh, distinct. So just to give you a little bit of a flavor here, so, um, Anderson here uh, uses a whole bunch of, of cartoons from a German cartoon magazine it's called Simplicicus to illustrate the electoral fraud. So what you see here, this, this sort of chubby person in the front is a German Junker in front of his estate somewhere probably in, 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 in Eastern Germany talking to his subject. And he's saying after the election, oh, there was one liberal vote cast. From today on, the schoolmaster gets no more potatoes, right? So. Um, so she's sort of trying to get at the, the implications of electoral fraud through, um, through sort of cartoons and qualitative data. Um, Zeeblad, on the other hand, collects data about electoral disputes uh, all across uh, Germany in, in different electoral districts and is trying to explain the, the sort of variation. So how are these two... Um, um, papers different in terms of the way they use history. Uh, the first one is in terms of their focus on change. So for Anderson, electoral fraud is something new, uh, something related to the recent expansions of the male franchise in, in, in Germany. And she's trying to understand the implication uh, of this electoral fraud for, for German sort of democratization. So she looks at electoral fraud from the perspective of the 19th century. So she's reading history forward. Ziblatt, on the other hand, is, has a focus not so much on change, but variation. For him, electoral fraud is unchanged over time. There's no difference between the fraud in the 19th century and the fraud in the 21st century. And so this uh, leads them to ask very different questions. The questions by Anderson is much more exploratory. Uh, so she's trying to figure out, what does electoral fraud tell us about Germany's uh, uh, democratization? And the answer that she comes up with is that electoral fraud was not so much a dysfunction of democracy, but a sign of sort of a, a, an emerging democratic culture. Because for her, the focus is um, on how German everyday subjects are challenging the electoral frauds by um, the aristocrats by factory owners and thereby sort of carving out um, uh, a political space. So if you think of the cartoon, they're mocking the incumbent uh, elites and therefore it becomes a sign for uh, Germany's changing more democratic political culture. 
For Ziblatt, on the other hand, the focus is much more confirmatory, right? So he's interested in this sort of cross-sectional variation and is using the 19th century to test existing theories and come up with uh, alternative explanations. So this difference between exploration and confirmation is really at the heart of historical thinking. Uh, and that's the sort of the key uh, contribution. So let me now sort of zoom out from these two examples and see whether we can generalize a little bit more broadly about what the key characteristics are of, uh, of historical thinking. And the way I would like to do this is with this, this uh, ontological map. So what you have here is you have here historical thinking in this corner, and then its counterpart statistical thinking uh, in the other corner. And, um, and the way we can think of these two different modes of social inquiry is in terms of the assumptions they make about history and geography. So here, this vertical axis uh, differentiates history in terms of the degree of, 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 of historicity. Uh, so the important point is that history is not a binary, it's not a dummy variable. It's not like you do history or you don't do history. You can do history to different degrees. You can freeze history more or less. So what we have here is this frozen version of history is referred to as uh, cyclical history, that history repeats itself and therefore the present is always the same as the past. So in many ways, this sort of cyclical history is, is ahistorical because there is no change involved. And in this cyclical history, you don't have to pay attention to dates, right? If yesterday is the same as today and as, as tomorrow, dates don't really uh, matter. Then at the other end of the spectrum here, you have a fully unfrozen notion of history. That's the one that historians employ where change is constant and therefore you have to be very attentive to chronologies and dates to pay attention. So history here can be distinguished in terms of how frozen and unfrozen it is. And the same thing here with geography, right? You can assume that geography doesn't really matter, that any location is the same, and therefore we don't have to pay attention to, to zip codes or geographic uh, coordinates. Or at the other end of the spectrum, right, every you, location is unique and exceptional, and therefore it's unfrozen. Um, so in many ways, these, these, oops, hold on here. Um, these, these two assumptions about geography and, and, and history correspond to the, the assumptions that statistics make about conditional independence, which is corresponds to history, and unit homogeneity, which relates to the assumptions about geography. And so what this ontological map allows us to do is identify the location, the intellectual terrain where comparative historical analysis operates. Notice just how vast that terrain is, right? It is much larger than the historical terrain or the statistical terrain. Um, moreover, what this map sort of tries to bring across is that comparative historical analysis tries to build a bridge between pure statistical thinking and pure historical thinking. And that way it makes it so exciting because it opens up a dialogue between two modes of analysis that are broadly viewed as, as utterly incompatible with one another that really don't have much um, to learn from in, each other. The other thing this map sort of uh, tries to bring across, notice this here, this lower um, southeast corner here would be the logical home of comparative historical analysis. But historical analysis does not impose an ontological boundary uh, that defines itself. Instead, it, it, it is very sort of heterodox. Um, and the reason why this is the case is because comparative historical analysis is problem driven. It's trying to answer real occurring questions that uh, happen out there in the world. And uh, once it identifies the question, it then picks the method that seems appropriate for that particular question. So this explains its, 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 its heterodoxy. And just to uh, illustrate, so Ziblatt would sort of fall here in this, this, this corner and Anderson uh, up here. So I hope this gives you a little bit um, of an idea of um, the, the elements of, of historical thinking and how the unfreezing of geography and, ge and, and, and history are sort of the, the key characteristics that, um, 
uh, historians and comparative historical analysts use to have a more exploratory approach to uh, social uh, social inquiry. So, um, so if if the goal of uh, historical thinking is to be more exploratory, is to embrace a world uh, that is more um, more more complex. Um, the challenge then becomes is how do you translate those discoveries into new insights? How do you translate uh, these uh, uh, discoveries into descriptions, into patterns of historical change? Um, and in order to um, uh, leverage these discoveries into uh, new insights that we then can use to update our theories, uh, comparative historical thinking employs something called uh, temporal thinking. And this temporal thinking really has, has two key elements. It, it operates on two distinct notions of time, historical time and physical time. So let me just quickly uh, walk you through them. Historical time, we already encountered. That's the notion of time that is closely linked to historical thinking. And its key elements of historical time um, is you pay great attention to dates. When something happens is incredibly important to chronologies, to uh, the, 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 the sequence of uh, events. Um, and then your unit of analysis is the event. So that is whatever happens on that particular day or time period is the event. And then you use these events, you lump and split them into periods. Um, so the, the objective of historical time is to describe, is to describe continuities and discontinuities. It is an effort to try to make historical change more understandable by parsing it into periods of continuities and discontinuities. And so these periodization schemes that help us understand when history moved very quickly or when it moved very slowly or not at all, helps us understand ultimately how the past is different from the present. And this question of how the past is different from the present uh, is the key element of historical time. Physical time, on the other hand, is something that historians pay less attention to, but that is uh, sort of a value added that comparative historical analysis brings to historians and make it different from just uh, straight up historical analysis. And these elements of physical time are uh, tempo, whether something is moving fast or slow, duration, whether something happens long or a short period of time, sequencing before and after, and timing. And so the key distinction between physical and historical time is that physical time really focuses on temporal dynamics that are context independent, right? That uh, these elements of duration and time um, have the same characteristics, irrespective of whether they occur in the 19th century, 20th century, or 21st century. Um, and these elements of physical time help refine the analysis of, of historical change because it allows us to differentiate the rhythms of this change. Is the historical change fast, slow, early, or, 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 or late? Um, and these elements of, of physical time also help us identify trends. Or, or do we have historical trends that are secular, secular cyclical, or, or, or seasonable? So let me then quickly illustrate these two uh, elements of time with, with uh, some examples. So what you have here is, is sort of a rather complex um, uh, timeline um, that illustrates these elements of, of historical time. See, so at the bottom here, what you have is a timeline, right? So this is uh, uh, the birth of Christ. This is BC, this is AD. And then if you zoom in, you have the actual years. So, so this is, uh, here you get the elements of time. Then in, in, in this row here, um, Priestley lists various reigns of kings. That gives you a certain degree of, of, of elements. And then here on the vertical axis, he differentiates geography. So, so here in this area, you have the European countries, uh, Asian countries, and then African countries. Um, so we, we have the key elements here of, of historical time. And the major takeaway of this map 
is to try to understand historical change. In this particular instance, it's the change of political regimes. So you see here, you have the origins of the Roman Empire, and then these here are the heydays of the uh, Roman Empire. Here is the, the split with Constantinople, and then the Eastern Empire emerging. And so this, this um, visualization here helps you understand the changing nature of political regimes. Moreover here, sort of from starting from the 16th and 17th century onwards, you see French, Spanish, and, and, and English. You have the emergence of modern nation states out of the sort of more um, localized, fragmented uh, political entities that preceded this sort of period. So this sort of chart illustrates the major focus of historical time of trying to make historical change more legible by lumping events into periods of continuity and, uh, and, and discontinuity. Um, um, so let me just quickly go over the elements of physical time again. Duration and tempo, I think, are, are pretty self-explanatory. Sequencing is a little bit trickier because the word sequencing has different uses and meanings. The uses in comparative historical analysis is a little bit more technical. Um, what it does, it, it, it looks at pairs of events uh, across units of analysis and, and looks at before and after differentiations. So for example, Dahl has this famous distinctions between contestations and participation in terms of democratization. At what point did uh, the franchise expand that, that uh, gave more people an opportunity to participate in politics? And when did contestation expand by um, giving elites the freedom of speech and parliaments the ability to challenge uh, kings? And so what he's trying to figure out, what was the sequence in which these two events unfolded over time? In some countries, you had democratization preceding contestations, and in others, it was the reverse. And depending on this sequence, you had different sort of democratization paths. Uh, timing, on the other hand, is, is comparing whether a similar event happened early or, or, or late. Uh, so Gershon Kron's work on um, the industrialization uh, differentiated between early uh, industrializers like Belgium and the UK and later ones like Japan and, uh, and Germany. And this late early distinction is important uh, because the later ones can learn from uh, the earlier ones. And then I'm not gonna go in, into the stages. So let me give you an example here. So this is a diagram, a natural history of immunization programs, right? So it looks at pandemics. So first of all, notice it's a natural history. So what it's trying to capture here is temporal dynamics that all pandemics share in common, right? So irrespective of whether they have in the 19th, 20 or 21st century. So what this, this diagram sort of shows here at the beginning, notice you have the time axis down below here, but there are no dates. Instead, you have sort of a generic um, label called maturity. And then on the vertical axis, you have the frequencies, the number of incidents. So here you have the, the disease starts out, you have a vaccination program. As vaccination increases, this decrease, diseases decrease. Then you have a, a second outbreak, a mutation of the virus. The confidence sort of dips uh, and then increases again. Uh, and as vaccination stops, it, it declines here and, um, and you have the eradication. So, um, so this diagram here um, can be analyzed in terms of these elements of physical time. First of all, here you have tempo. So, so the, the slope of this, this line here is very steep and therefore implies a very rapid increase uh, of vaccination coverage, right? Um, here you have the duration. So this loss of confidence is relatively uh, short here. And then you have the sequencing. This is the sequencing is in terms of what is the sequence between the outbreak of a, a pandemic and the availability of a vaccine. So it seems here that the vaccine was available almost simultaneously with the outbreak. And therefore, um, the, the pandemic was brought under control very, very quickly. Um, the element of timing here is not shown in this uh, uh, diagram, 
But um, if you just recall in our recent experience, you had China who had the outbreak earlier than uh, Europe, than the United States, and, and, and in the African continent. And the timing of when the outbreak started in turn had some sort of uh, consequences for how public health officials could respond to, to those uh, pandemics. But again, notice that these elements of physical time are context independent. Uh, they are recurring in pandemics at different moments uh, in, in history. And so it is this interplay between historical and physical time really that uh, are at the heart of comparative historical analysis and that, that help um, uh, comparative historical analysis to translate historical thinking into interesting historical patterns as well as interesting uh, theoretical insights. So those are the two sort of key temporal elements of comparative historical analysis. Um, so let me then uh, pivot to the third element of comparative historical analysis, namely uh, abductive thinking. Um, so go back to the um, this ontological map uh, that I had shown earlier. And, and recall that comparative historical analysis operates um, in an ontologically sort of more complex world, right? If you unfreeze geography, if you unfreeze history, by definition, you are willing to embrace a world that is more disorderly, that is more complex, and therefore it gives you more opportunity to explore and come up with new inductive insights. But by uh, the same token, you also have a world that is probably a little bit too disorderly in order to deploy the standard uh, testing tools that variance-based methodologies employ. And so what um, comparative historical analysis therefore does is it uses slightly different strategies to make causal inferences than variance-based um, analysis. And um, these strategies are sometimes um, lumped together under this label abductive thinking. I will explain the, uh, the term a little bit more fully in just a moment. The two key elements of this abductive thinking um, is a, an older, more traditional notion of methodology of a methodology as research cycles. The idea of methodology of research cycles basically um, points out that causal inferences have a history uh, and that this history is, um, uh, plays an important role for generating confidence in causal inferences. Um, and this sort of methodology as sort of research cycles uh, is informed by a certain Bayesian logic of, of causal inference that I will touch on in just a moment. And the second um, characteristic of this abductive thinking is that comparative historical analysis um, employs a more dualistic notion of causal inference, where um, causal inferences require not just rigorous testing, but also theorizing. That theorizing is important uh, because you also want to have test-worthy hypotheses that um, give you confidence that your results actually provide you with some answers. So let me elaborate on these um, two elements of abductive thinking, first by looking at uh, these uh, idea of a research cycle. So what you have here is uh, sort of these six steps of a research process, right? So the, the three blue ones uh, involve the more exploratory stages of research. The first one is sort of the description. This refers to the type of historical thinking and the use of, of uh, physical and historical time that I covered. Uh, the next one involves conceptualization because comparative historical analysis doesn't just want to analyze individual unique events, it wants to compare them and generalize. And for this, you need um, you need uh, concepts. Um, and then finally, it, um, it tries to uh, avoid overly narrative explanation. It's committed to, to having broader, more systematic explanations, and that involves uh, a theorizing. And this theorizing process involves a very close sort of dialogue with 
uh, existing theories and trying to, to, to update them. So those are sort of these, these three exploratory stages. And then uh, you have the next three stages that are more confirmatory where, you know, those ones are well known, how to collect data, how to identify cases, samples, and so forth, data analysis, what sort of techniques for causal inference do you use, and then how do you go about uh, uh, replicating. And so the, the key characteristic of comparative historical analysis is that it defines methodology as involving all six of these stages. And it tries to push back against the notion that methods really only involves the elements of confirmation, that, that, uh, that description, conceptualization, and theorizing are pre-methodological, and we, that we don't need to pay attention to those elements in order to come up with uh, sound causal inferences. Um, and um, and this, this rejection of splitting methodology into a pre-methodological exploratory stage and then a more systematical confirmatory stage is the key characteristic of this sort of abductive thinking, that these stages interact with one another in, 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 in complex uh, ways. The second important point about these research cycles is not just that causal inferences involve exploration and confirmation and the interplay between those, but it is an iterative process, right? That once you reach uh, the final stage here with the replication, then you go back and do more inductive uh, uh, analysis. You describe, you, you, you return to historical thinking to reevaluate your findings and, and your answers. You reevaluate your, your concepts and your theories and thereby knowledge evolves. So this inductive thinking in many ways employs a, a historical no notion of knowledge production, that you can't just uh, ascertain a causal inference in terms of a single uh, statistical metric, some p-value or statistical value to tell you whether a finding is significant. No, you have to evaluate any given sort of causal inference in terms of the, the prior knowledge that we have on, on that particular subject matter, the prior uh, concepts, the prior theories, and then sort of update it. And so it's this iterative uh, nature of the research process um, that uh, comparative historical analysis shares with, uh, with Bayesian analysis. So, so this is the, the first element of this abductive uh, thinking, the first characteristic. The second characteristic is that it employs a more dualistic notion of causal inference. You see this dualistic notion uh, come up in some of these quotes. So the first one here is by Ronald Coase. He's a famous economist uh, who, who uh, quipped that if you torture data long enough, nature will confess. So this is sort of basically making a little bit fun of, of data mining, of p-hacking, of sort of the, the improper use of uh, statistical techniques. Uh, Christy Ashwan um, has sort of elaborates on, on this by pointing out that it's easy to get results, but difficult to produce answers. So here again, she recognizes that uh, testing gives you results, but those results really don't tell us anything unless we have sound theory that then translate those results into answers. So she sort of alludes to this interplay between confirmation and theorizing. Um, and so we can think of causal inference here in terms of these two dimensions, right? The quality of the hypothesis um, and the quality of a hypothesis is improved through theorizing. So you, you, you shouldn't just take any hypothesis at face value, but ask yourself, you know, how testworthy is this hypothesis in the first place? Where does it come from? Is it clearly articulated? That is, has some causal mechanisms. So there's a whole sort of series of, of, of tools that comparative historical analysis uh, uses in order to assess the quality of a hypothesis, assess its testworthiness. And then over here, we can think of the quality of the research design Again, this is the more familiar part where, you know, uh, the research design can be differentiated 
in terms of how clearly does it improve uh, the ability to isolate causal effects, right? Can we uh, take advantage of randomization, um, natural experiments, uh, and, and, or, 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 or process tracing? So what this uh, produces then is essentially four possible causal inferences, right? Here, where you have weak results and weak answers. This is essentially what p-hacking and, and um, um, p-hacking or data mining is. It's really not, we don't learn much of anything. You can improve on this by using more uh, advanced statistical uh, techniques where you get robust results, but still weak answers. Um, I would put economists in this category because very often I find the theories that economists use uh, sort of so, so weak, so contrived that uh, much of the economic uh, um, research is, is, has strong results, but weak answers. And then you have down here, weak answers and robust, uh, weak results and robust answers. This is sometimes, you know, where some of the more historical work uh, implies. It has very sophisticated theories, uh, but the causal inference strategies are not particularly uh, explicit and, and transparent. And so we have the dilemma that we have weak results, but strong answers. And so the, the goal of course, is to reach this uh, upper corner here, the robust results uh, and, and um, robust answers. And uh, the way we get up here is through abduction, through uh, sort of a Bayesian updating uh, uh, process. Um, and comparative historical analysis is, 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 is full of, of uh, tools and, and, and suggestions of how to move from weak results and weak answers to more robust results and uh, robust answers. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, the, the time constraints prevent me from going into uh, those um, abductive strategies uh, a little bit uh, more, more, more fully. So, um, so, so we sort of covered the three uh, central elements, the free of this comparative historical analysis, the key elements of this uh, grammar of time that um, define comparative historical analysis. And you notice that the key focus is really on taking time seriously, paying greater attention to time, and then sort of working out what the methodological implications are of taking time uh, more, more, more seriously. So let me just uh, quickly wrap up by pulling some of these uh, themes here uh, together. Um, by returning to this ontological map um, that uh, I had shown earlier on in this section of historical thinking. So recall you have here again, the vertical axis is, is the freezing of history. Here you have the freezing of geography, you have mathematical thinking and historical thinking. And so what this uh, ontological map um, is also helpful for is to sort of um, locate the different methodologies and thereby uh, help us understand their complementarity. So what we have here is of course the variance-based uh, analysis here is in this lower left-hand corner, closely linked to mathematical or statistical thinking. Then if you think of QCA, right, one of the key trademarks of QCA is to unfreeze geography. Uh, its emphasis on equifinality sort of more or less tries to uh, raise the question is that you can have um, similar outcomes in different countries explained by different uh, uh, theories or similar theories producing different outcomes in different geographies. So it sort of um, unfreezes geography. And then you have ethnography up here, right? Um, that uh, unfreezes geography even more than QCA, but it's not really historical. It, it just gives you some sort of snapshot. Now understand there are some uh, traditions in ethnography that have a more historical focus, but most ethnography is, is pretty sort of uh, static. And then over here, of course, you have the historical narratives offered by historians. And this again leaves this vast space here open uh, that is methodologically very uh, heterodox and requires what I call methodological triage. That is, remember we, we pointed out that comparative historical analysis is problem-driven. That is, it, it selects the method that fits 
the question it is trying to answer rather than uh, defining the question in terms of the methods that it is uh, uh, employing. And so what, um, what comparative historical analysis does, it fills this space here with roughly three different sort of causal inference strategies. The first one is, is process tracing, right? So process tracing, uh, there's another course that Derek Beach um, uh, is, is offering at the uh, Methods Nest. The process tracing really uh, is the closest to the variance-based analysis because it is also uh, committed to testing hypothesis. And by testing, in order to test the hypothesis, it has a relatively static notion of history uh, that it employs. Uh, but it differs from variance-based analysis in, in that it is trying to uh, gain confidence in causal inferences by looking for evidence of the causal mechanisms stipulated by the theory. So it, it is opening up a lot more of the sort of the black boxes uh, that are implicit in statistical models. Um, so the, 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 the process tracing plays an important role uh, in comparative historical analysis. And you, you start seeing that comparative historical analysis overlaps with uh, with qualitative methods. Uh, the next type of sort of causal inference strategy uh, is referred to as historical explanations. Historical explanation is a term that comparative historical analysis uses to refer to path dependent arguments uh, or uh, critical juncture arguments. So these historical um, explanations, notice they are employing a much more unfrozen notion uh, of, of history and are trying to explain historical change and historical continuities in terms of uh, distinct explanations. So the, 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 these continuities are explained in terms of uh, so-called genetic explanations, where you're trying to retrace the, 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 the causal mechanisms, the generative mechanisms that bring about a change, that produce a particular revolution, that lead to the breakdown of, of, a, of a democracy. Um, and then the other part of the historical explanations are these path-dependent uh, explanations where you're trying to explain the absence of change. If you have historical periods of continuity, historical explanations don't assume that this continuity is a given, but itself is the result of certain causal mechanisms. And so it draws on path-dependent arguments by looking at increasing returns uh, mechanisms to explain this sort of continuity. And then the final space down below here is you have evolutionary or demographic explanations. Uh, evolutionary explanations, notice um, they're, they're not particularly common in comparative historical analysis, but you find them, for example, uh, among demographers or economic historians or economic institutionalists. And very often these explanations sort of have a certain functional uh, uh, logic to them, where history is efficient and history will pick a set of institutions uh, that are more efficient than others. And so you explain uh, historical change in terms of sort of um, natural selection uh, uh, dynamic. But as I said, uh, these evolutionary arguments are, uh, uh, are not uh, very prominent in comparative historical analysis and usually looked at uh, with a skeptical eye because they tend to be overly deterministic uh, and, uh, and sort of functionalist. So I hope this gives you a little bit of an idea of what the key elements of comparative historical analysis are, what this grammar of time sort of tries to uh, bring to making comparative historical analysis uh, more systematic. Recall earlier pointed out that comparative historical analysis has this distinct origin story where it evolved uh, independently of each other in economics, in sociology, in political science, in, in comparative history. And so what comparative historical analysis therefore um, sort of uh, is, is marked by is that it's spoken in many different vernaculars, right? And these vernaculars don't always communicate with each other as effectively as they could. And so what, what this, this book is trying to do 
is try to explicate uh, a more common temporal vocabulary that um, these various strands of comparative historical analysis uh, use and explicate um, how it is using time in a rather systematic uh, uh, manner. And, um, and so just um, to point out, um, this all seemed very sort of broad and, and give you sort of a bird's eye uh, perspective. Uh, comparative historical analysis uses a lot of very sort of specific tools that you know um, can be taught and applied and, and give very practical research advice. Um, if you are interested in some of those tools, I was unfortunately unable to to delve into them uh, more closely. But this is what my my book is doing and what I'm also doing in the courses that I teach. So if you're interested in some of those tools, I'll encourage you to 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 sign up uh, for the course. And one final takeaway that I want you to uh, make is remember comparative historical analysis is trying to build a bridge between history and variance-based analysis. Um, so comparative historical analysis is really kind of um, impatient with these methods wars that try to put different methods into ontologically incompatible sort of categories where you can't really talk to each other, right? Where the more arrogant uh, uh, proponents of variance-based analysis make fun of historical analysis for being just storytellers or barefoot empiricists, or where proponents of more interpretive or historical narratives make fun of variance-based approaches for being sort of pseudoscientific uh, and, 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 and overly deterministic. Uh, the, the major takeaway from comparative historical analysis is any mode of analysis rests on presuppositions, rests on presuppositions about geography, about uh, history, and therefore, um, if we become more mindful about these underlying ontological assumptions, um, we, we open up a dialogue for among different methods, because one, some methods are appropriate for certain questions and inappropriate for others. And, um, and, and we can learn from each other. I mean, variance-based analysis requires theory. It requires exploration, right? Um, and, uh, but it doesn't tell you how to do it. Well, this is where comparative historical analysis can be helpful. Moreover, you know, variance-based analysis, I mean, there are an endless number of statistical tools, time series analysis, event analysis. It has some tools, some statistical tools that in gain might help um, uh, compare historical analysis to improve its sort of, sort of testing strategies. So comparative historical analysis really kind of rejects this implicit uh, sort of epistemology the methods wars in which different methods sort of compete against one another uh, for, for ep epistemological goal. And so I hope that um, this is sort of one major takeaway that you have uh, from this course.